and uh, Xander's going to give us some hints and tips for uh, how to make the world a better place through audio, and more importantly, how to make our games better. Well, thank you, Liam. Hi, everyone. Uh, so, yes, this is a question you may find yourselves asking yourselves later down the track. So maybe let's explore some of those reasons. Um, for a start, uh, I'm Xander. I am a game audio designer, which is a bit of a funny title because we've got sound engineers and composers and sound designers and other stuff. And in the indie industry, we kind of rolled a lot of those titles into one. So I do all that stuff. So I just say I'm a game audio designer. But these are some of the games I've worked on, uh, mostly in mobile, moving into um, the uh, console space now, which is cool. But that's uh, some of the cool stuff I get to do. So firstly, what this talk is not about how to fix your game specifically. Um, and it's not about the ins and outs of audio design and how that all works. And it's not about bunnies. Um, and it is about pointing out all the things that you're likely to encounter, these problems that you don't know exist yet, because you don't know what you don't know you don't know, you know? <laughs> so you've got a lot of these problems that audio people know about that other people don't know about, and then you're going to run into them, and you're not going to know what they are and why they're causing problems for you. And so maybe if you know they're coming, you can plan for them. So I'm just highlighting the problems. But um, could anyone who works in sound or is an audio person or interested in sound put their hand up, perhaps? These are the people you might want to have a chat with later. <laughs> because even if they don't know how to solve these problems yet, they're going to be interested in learning how to solve these problems and helping you solve these problems. So pre-production and production. So what do you have you been doing wrong before you've even started? Um, one of them might be that you didn't hire a sound designer. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, I understand a lot of you are small indie devs and beginners and students and other people who can't afford to pay other people to work for you. And that's a bit of a problem. But sure, you're going to do everything off your own bat. You're doing your own art. You're doing your own sound. That's great. Go for it. You know, do your multidisciplinary thing. But you can always talk to us. There's a lot of uh, people who put their hands up before. There's a lot of sound designers around, and there's a lot of professional sound designers around, and we're embedded in the community, and we're around. And if you come to all the networking events and you meet people, you'll be able to talk to us. And the great thing that I love about our Australian games industry here is that we all share, and we are so good at sharing with each other. And if you talk to a sound designer, they will want to help you and give you advice. And maybe later down the track, you can help them with some things. I'm learning to program. I'm really bad at it. I get a lot of help from people <laughs> uh, in my co-working space in Brisbane, the game space where I work. And you know that's reciprocal. So that's definitely something you should uh, look at. So your first pitfall you might uh, encounter is that you're mixing genres. So um, if you're doing a game about a big barbarian and you have sound effects that are big and, and tough, and you've got some like weird like magical girl sound effects and stuff, which are really cool, um, maybe not like a good mix. And it's just because a lot of people don't actually realize sound effects have genres. We all know music has genres, and art has genres, and games have genres. But sound effects themselves are actually genred very heavily. And so when you mix together sounds you bought online or from various sources, you just need to make sure they gel and they can fit together in, in, a, in a full scene. Now, here's um, a big problem. Is that a lot of people, I, I see everyone coding with headphones. We were talking before about people coding with headphones. You're not listening to the games you're working on, though, are you? <laughs> You listen to podcasts or music and other things, and that's fine. But when you play test, you need to listen to what you are testing. Because there's a lot of audio bugs in there, just like there's a lot of other other bugs. And if you don't catch the audio bugs, they're going to slip through. And there's another thing, which is, uh, I've had this on a game I worked on before, where we're working on a mobile platform. They've got some sounds in there they've bought, and they put them in. They think the mix is good, and everything's fine. And say, have you worn headphones when you tested the game? And they go, well, no. So here's, here's an explosion. <laughs> right? As heard on an iPad. Here is that same explosion if I take off the um, high-pass filter. <laughs> and that's um, an enormous volume difference because of that huge low-frequency content which you're missing. So you really need to test all of your different situations. If you're working on Switch, you need to test it on a home theater system and on the console's little speakers and on your headphones to make sure your mix is good. So sound creation. Um, if you are making your own sounds, these are some of the problems you're probably making for yourself. Your loops aren't seamless. 
Uh, loops are tricky, it's true. But there's basically a few things you need to do to make sure that your loops are good. So um, your perfect sine loop, right? So these are just the C4, a note. Uh, it's just a sine wave. Here what we've got is we've got zero point crossings. And when you start and end your sounds, you want that line to be on the zero point. That's the most important thing. So this is what a normal sine wave loop will sound like. Very nice, right? Beautiful in its simplicity, perhaps. Now, this is what happens if you've cut that at the wrong spot, and it's not at a zero point crossing. Hear that pop at the end? That is the sound of this wave pushing you to the speaker, forwards and backwards, and then it gets to the end of the file, which pushed out, and says, no more data, and just jumps back to zero. So you really want to avoid that. And this is what happens if you make a loop that doesn't even meet. So the top and the bottom, they, they don't even touch each other. This is what that sounds like. Really not good. Another problem, your sync is off. If you fire a gun, bang, afterwards. No good, right? So here's uh, the problem here, is that in, if you're working in film or other backgrounds and everything, it doesn't matter if you've got a little bit of head and tail on your sounds. In games, it's very important. So that little bit of sound there, at silence, you need to chop that out. But at the end, that's useless, taking up space, get rid of it. You end up with a much nice, cleaner thing, and when you shoot the gun, the bang will actually happen. Now, this is a weird one that I don't understand what people are not noticing, especially if you're watching like YouTube videos and stuff, and then occasionally you'll get into one, and it'll be like in this horrible, echoey space. And I, uh, it drives me nuts. But basically, in this room, if we have a listen, we can hear this sort of echo on my voice. That's because we're in a big room, and that makes sense. But if I were like speaking directly into your ear, or you're hearing it like that, that'd be weird. Or if we sound like we're in an enormous cavern, that'd also be really weird. And when you're in a game, Everything needs to sound like it's actually in the place that you're in, or you have this mismatch mentally where it just doesn't feel right. So you really need to um, take that into account. And a, a really good thing is, if you make your recordings really dry, record them as like in, under a blanket or in a recording booth, or whatever you can manage, you can then apply a reverb in-game and make everything have consistent, nice reverb. So talking about doing things in-game, these are the bits you're probably doing wrong after you've made the sounds, and you're putting them in wrong. So you're not using reverb at all. If you use no reverb whatsoever, everything sounds like it happens between your ears. And <laughs> that can be very disconcerting. And nobody walks like this. This is, if you're hearing footsteps, they need to sound like they're below you. Which can be a bit of an odd concept, because you can't, you pan left to right, you can't pan down. So it, that's what reverb does. It's a really subtle effect. When you can have big cavernous reverbs, but you can also have really subtle reverb, which just you don't notice, but it makes it feel like the space is real and the footsteps are not on your face. Now your listener is probably positioned wrong. This is the one I encounter devs coming to me because they're confused why it feels wrong in the, the space, the spread, right? So for example here, right? Um, in games we have like orthographic cameras and things like that. We've got, basically imagine there's a camera over there, which there is, we don't have to imagine very hard. Um, <laughs> it's filming me. If it were filming just my torso upwards, right? It's pretty zoomed in. And if you're hearing the sound from like a microphone that's sitting on the camera over there, it's gonna sound kind of weird and distant and wrong, right? But aside from that, if you had that a stereo image, right? And I had a sound over here and a sound over here, and that's like the leftmost and rightmost parts of the screen, it should sound like that to your face, right? But if you've got the, um, the listener on the camera, and the camera's really far away, then let's say like you're looking at a phone screen, right? The phone screen is here, and a, a, a plane goes from the left to the right. You don't want to hear zoom, because that does not match what you're seeing. You want to hear something that sounds like it's going from here to here. So you need to reassess the angles that you're using. So it takes some maths, but you need to reposition your listener so that when something is, is um, panning from left to right, your full left and full right match your visual perception of where is that in the space in the game when you're playing. Now this is the most common thing that makes games sound really amateurish. You can get, you can buy really fancy, expensive, beautiful sound effects and put them into your game and it just sounds cheap still anyway. And that's because volume balancing is so important. It is like the most important thing in music, 
Um, I used to work as a music producer. That was like most of my job, was just balancing like levels and making it sound right. So it's something you're going to have to sink a lot of time into. But unfortunately, our tools do not make that easy because we've got this nice slider here in Unity. Isn't it great? It goes from zero to one. <laughs> Which makes me think they did not consult any sound engineers. Because sound doesn't work that way. Sound is logarithmic. It works in decibels. So uh, I can't really explain it all here. But sound, it's, there's already a lot of weird calculations to go on. Because let's say you've got 50 violins. You say, I want that to be as loud as 100 violins. Do you double the volume? No, that's not how it works at all. That's another weird conversion. But let's say we've got a sound, right? And it's sitting up there at 6 decibels. It's very loud. We want to drop it to half the volume. We drop it down to minus 12 decibels. We want to drop it again, half the volume. We take another 6 off. It goes to minus 18, right? No matter where you're sitting, you can take off 6 decibels. It becomes half as loud. Beautiful, perfect, elegant. If you're working in a linear system, and you've got one, and you want to take off half the volume, you go to 0.5. And if you want to take off half the volume again, you go to 0.25. And you take off a smaller and smaller amount to get half as loud as you are right now, every time. What if you're at 0.8, and you want to take off two thirds of the volume? Oh. <laughs> so you need to realize that. You can't go through and go, oh, everything is too loud. I'm just going to grab everything and take 0.1 off the volume. You'll ruin your mix. Everything changes in proportion to each other. It'd be terrible. Um, this is a, <laughs> a funny little one. Your 3D spread is wrong. So that, that is a stampede of wildebeest uh, in a tin can. And if you imagine a stampede of wildebeest right now, it's very wide. It's all around you. You're hearing it all around you. And a tin can, of course, is very small. You hear it from a point. So sound is kind of like light. And um, I really didn't want to confuse this concept with size, right? Because big things sound low and deep and booming and loud. And small things sound tiny and tiny. But the, aside from all that, big things sound like they take up space. And if you have a stampede and you set your stereo spread to nothing, it sounds like it's really focused. It's still loud and big and impactful, but it's tiny. And it's like a, a train, a freight train going past you, and you just hear, oh, the freight train is exactly here. When it's a huge, long thing, it's continuing, and you're only hearing a single point of it and perceiving that very clearly. So um, your ears are really good at perceiving things, and we've got lots of great tricks to trick your ears into perceiving things. But spread is one of them. You need to make sounds actually be wide if they're wide or narrow if they're narrow. Now, um, variations uh, are a big problem. Let's hear what it sounds like if I've just got one footstep sound. Twenty, right? Um, so, you may have noticed that's the same recording over and over and over again, and you think, sure, it's the same shoe. Why not? <laughs> but we're hearing the same uh, shoelace like flapping against it in the exact same timing, and it's a really weird thing that our ears do is that we can pick up patterns. We're great at picking up patterns with our brains, right? Um, but then sometimes we hear the same recording, the exact same recording, suddenly that's fake and weird and it snaps you out of the game experience. So if you use some variations, sounds more like someone walking. You alright, that's enough out of you. <laughs> now there's another problem also which is, um, and this is a problem I've even seen in like Nintendo games, it's uh, uh, not recently but it's something we need to think about because quite often you go, great, we've got all our footstep variations, we'll make them all happen randomly, random is good and random is fine. But what if you've got multiple people walking? We got, okay, we've got one person walking. Right, one person walking, okay. Now we've got four people walking, we've got four people, they're all gonna emanate one footstep each. That's just, now, I was going to say that's four times as loud. It's not four times as loud, actually. That's about 2.5 times as loud as the first one because you've got four sources. Anyway, um, the, uh, the problem here is that when you randomize things, you can sometimes have two sources randomly choose the same thing. And then what you hear is, if you've got one over here and one over here, you hear one that is louder in the middle, which is totally the opposite of what you want. So you need to shuffle your sounds instead, like a deck of cards. You've got all your sounds. Don't play this one again until the other, all the other ones have gone through. And then, this is what four people walking should sound like. 
right? So um, time scale is one of my last points. <laughs> and uh, it's one because sound designers uh, are used to thinking about sounds in a very, 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 very short time scales. Um, and other people, it turns out, are not. Um, so let's look at this sine wave we played before. It's C4, that's 262 hertz. That's 262 up and down cycles, the bit I've highlighted there, per second. That's quite a few. So this little bit I've chopped out here, that's one millisecond pause in the middle of this. So I'm going to play this for you. I'm going to see if we can hear a one millisecond gap. One millisecond. But you noticed it, didn't you? Now, if you're working on, say you've made a, a function that loops your music for you or something, right? Or you've got an ambience and you go, okay, I'm going to loop it. I'm going to go on update, check, is music still playing? No, okay, if it's not playing, play music. Great, solved, right? But games work, I mean, your game is probably running at, say, 50 frames per second. That's 16 milliseconds, roughly. So that sounds like this. And the really weird thing is both of these times are shorter than you can actually perceive and think about as a time. So they probably sounded about the same, but that one was just more dramatic. <laughs> so these are the types of time scales we're having to think about when we're working with sound. And you need to be aware of that kind of stuff as well. Because a few milliseconds delay is the difference between a sound sounding like it's here or over there or other things like that. When you put an echo in this room, the tail of how long it takes, the early reflections that bounce off the walls. In VR, that's the kind of stuff that we're looking at to really trick your brain into perceiving objects are in certain locations and in certain environments. Now, your import settings are also probably wrong. And this is a big bummer because you can mess up your cart size, it can make your looping not work properly, it can chew up your CPU, it can use up all your RAM, and it can give you some really lossy sound and compression. It's gross. I could do a whole talk on that. It is terrible. You really need to look into it. Um, you could save your game a lot of trouble in performance. And lastly, the Doppler effect. Um, in Unity, for example, you'll notice there is a Doppler slider. If you might have to hunt for it, but there is a slider and it tells you the Doppler scale and you think it is set to one and you think, well, that is all right and everything is fine. But your game is probably not scaled to one. If you put, uh, if you measured, say, your first person character that you put into the game, how tall are they actually in unity units? Whatever that measurement is actually called. If it is not an actual normal height, if you convert that to meters, your Doppler scale is wrong. And so if you've got a setting where a unity unit is about this tall, so then I'm about, say, five or six meters tall, then me walking from here to here while I talk could have an enormous Doppler shift, a sort of <laughs> effect, because we're not thinking about the right scale of, of space here. So in some cases, you probably want to switch it off, depending on what the thing is, especially if it's a musical like a tone, like a bell ringing. You really notice bells ringing with the Doppler effect. Um, actually, this is one of my favorite game bugs I ever solved, was we had a game where the voices for characters were pooled. And when it was in use, it would disappear from wherever it was before and appear here and go. And it was a zombie game, and you come up to people and they go, ah, right? <laughs> or they go, ah. And uh, what was happening in the game is you'd meet someone and they'd go, eek. <laughs> and we didn't know what was causing this. And it turned out Doppler effect was taking into account the fact the sound was previously over here and zipped over to here in one frame and then made a sound. And it's like, well, obviously it's moving very fast and should sound very high. <laughs> And I later made it into the sound of corgis in the game. Uh, right. And that's, that's all I have to say on those. <laughs> oh, but lastly, I just want to mention that uh, the art, the drawings of the bunnies there were done by my good friend, Anya McNaughton, as well, who you should check out.